Thank you, the, the organizers, for inviting me to speak today. Um, as Anthony mentioned, I'm a, a scientist, so it's, I'm humbled to present in front of oncologists and ophthalmologists and pathologists. So it will be. Um, so forgive me if I make any wrong uh, statement. Uh, I think after um, Bertel introduction, I think I don't need a long introduction to the field, but basically we know that the outcomes of the patients with uh, uveal melanoma that have the bad prognosis uh, markers and they actually develop metastasis within very short time and most of and the, with no treatment available currently or the DGP100 data is very encouraging. The survival rate currently is very poor. So the, another option on treatment is whether we can identify, identify this patient earlier and actually treat them with adjuvant therapies and that's actually what I see as a dream a solution for this disease, considering that the markers of risk are so well defined. And that's actually something that attracted me this to disease as a scientist, because uh, compared to most cancers, this, the, the, the strengths of the markers of risk in this particular disease are remarkable. And this has been shown through the data from the Castle Bioscience Test, Decision DX, which is based on gene expression, as well as Bertil mentioned, and Bertil was uh, one of the pioneering in showing this uh, result that monosomy 3 accompanied, of course, with gaining chromosome AQ and many other somatic copy number alterations definitely define uh, the risk uh, of developing metastasis disease, and at this point, they're still uncurable. And this was brought together very elegantly by the data on the TCGA, showing that somatic copy number alterations, uh, as well as both monosomy 3, but more than that, uh, somatic copy number alterations define very good, very clearly the risk of the patients, and they define four different clusters, which I also refer as class 1 and class 2, class 1A and B and class 2, uh, A and B, and I just want to go through quickly through all those of these, and I'm sure uh, Nick and, and other speakers will refer to that, but basically uh, the presence of BAP1 mutations specially defined in com in, uh, together with loss of chromosome 3, the loss, uh, this worst class, and while these uh, mutations in E1AF, EIF1AX as well as SF3B1 are associated with the patients with uh, uh, better outcomes. And that kind of uh, set the idea, the model, that there is a divergence on the type of uh, prognosis of these patients and the evolution of the tumor. Uh, uh, with uh, the loss of chromosome 3, the, as well as the BAP1 mutation, uh, reprogram the cell in a way that they have a more stem cell uh, like markers and a petaloid, and they actually are the ones that eventually move into the circulation and colonize in the liver, mainly. Um, but what brings me to this disease is actually the idea that can we pro improve how this uh, test is done? And the reason is because we know that despite that the strength of this test uh, and their, on, on their prediction, they actually very frequently tumor biopsies are done other than out, in, outside the center of excellence. So not all the patients undergo the tumor biopsy for fear for complications or other reasons. But also there is not a consensus as once you find that the patient has a high risk to actually monitoring these patients uh, to, to identify that indeed they develop, when, when they, 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 they develop metastatic disease. And is there another way to do this than to, through a regular scanning, which are costly as well as they also expose the patients to radiation. So our idea was, can we identify these genetic markers through a blood test? And that's because that's uh, what I do. I basically work in a field of liquid biopsy, analysis of circulating tumor cells and circulating tumor DNA. So we thought, can we bypass the tumor by doing the analysis of somatic copy number alterations using circulating tumor cells? Um, and we know that circulating tumor cells are um, uh, well known um, that they are the ones that basically mediate the metastasis, so they will be, are likely to be present in a patient's blood. More, more than that, there have been many studies showing that circulating tumor cells can be prognostic in various diseases, but also provide 
tumor specific information. I think one of the poster childs of that is the ARBC mutation in prostate cancer to define patients that are resistant to treatment with uh, androgen receptor targeting therapies. This study from the Cancer UK was very, uh, also gave enc very encouraging for me in particular because they actually carry on somatic open alteration in a number of CTCs. So each column is a basically different circulating tumor cells across 22 chromosomes, and they can define a chemorefractory signature on these cells that have a 90% uh, accuracy on defining whether the patient will respond to chemotherapy. So we decide to apply uh, our methodology for analyzing circulating tumor cells to uveal melanoma. So the first question is, are these pre cells present in patients with primary disease? The tumor is quite small, so I was not sure. When I started the studies, I was not sure whether we were going to find anything. So we develop a method based on targeting MCSP or CSPG4 um, that is being shown before to be used to, the analysis, to capture circulating tumor cells in uvia melanoma. We furthered this methodology by an, an adding GP100, which is possibly one of our best methods for cap, our best markers to capture the circulating tumor cells, MCAN and ABCB5. So we mix that with the uh, PBMCs and we separate the cells. We stain, again, for GP100, melana, and S100. We discard white blood cells by staining with CD45 and CD16. And we actually then quantify the number of cells. In our original study, we enrolled 30 patients uh, with primary uveal melanoma. And none of these patients actually had metastatic disease at that point. And of those, we could evaluate circulating tumor cells, whether there were circulating tumor cells in 26 of these patients. And of those, 58% had circulating tumor cells with 1 to 22 cells in 8 mil of blood. We compared the number of circulating tumor cells to the primary tumor size, either the basal diameter or the apical height. And we found no correlation with the tumor size. What we also did, we, try, uh, we compare, we thought, well, maybe this is the ones producing circulating tumor cells are the ones disseminating. Um, and we, only in a small number of patients, but we had patients who undergo the biopsy, and we have uh, data whether they have monosomy or disomy 3, uh, and we compare the number of circulating tumor cells, and it doesn't seem that the presence of circulating tumor cells, so the capacity of the, the tumor, cells to disseminate into the bloodstream are actually driven by the monosomy 3. Uh, so it perhaps it's the capacity to colonize in a distant organ or survive. What defines is defined by these markers, but it's not the presence of circulating tumor cells per se. So we decide, well, maybe what we need to do with the circulating tumor cells is derive the genetic matter the genetic information. So we devised a method for whole genome amplification of circulating tumor cells. Uh, we actually pick singular cells, do whole genome amplification using the PyCoplex kit, and we do low-pass whole genome sequencing. It's, although it's whole genome sequencing because it's low-pass, it's not actually that expensive, and we can see very clearly different somatic copy number alteration across different chromosomes. We spend a lot of time trying to make sure, uh, making sure that the method doesn't create uh, um, artifacts, and that we can reproduce this even after we actually uh, pick the, enrich the cells, uh, uh, fix sperm, and stain the tumor cells, and we um, qualify that in various uvia melanoma cell lines. And we also did it with uh, white blood cells, so PBMCs, just to make sure that we don't create any artifacts. So using this method, we analyzed the um, a uveal melanoma patient, this is an example of uveal melanoma patient, where we have circulating tumor cells, and we can compare the circulating tumor cells to the primary tumor of the patient, and you can see that the copy number alterations that we identify in circulating tumor cells are representative of what we find in the tumor. This is a sample of circulating tumor DNA from the same patient, and uh, although you also can see the same alterations, they're a bit shallower than in circulating tumor cells because of the contaminant normal DNA that there is in the sample. And this is just a white blood cell as a negative control to make sure that there is no artifact. Using this method, we're now evaluating primary uveal melanoma. So far, one of our issues is the lack 
of tumor material on the patients that we have found the CTCs and we have sequenced. So we actually don't have a tumor to compare because many of these patients that we are evaluating haven't had a biopsy or a nucleation. So this will be the real important samples to obtain to be able to do that comparison. So this is uh, the circulating tumor cell for patients showing that they have uh, an amplification chromosome uh, 8, but we don't have a tumor to compare. This is another patient showing a various a loss of chromosome, a shallow loss of monosomy 3, as well as gaining 8. Um, but again, that, that this is a very critical point which you actually need to demonstrate the, this uh, correlation with the primary tumor to be able to validate this methodology. And of course, doing it in a large cohort and with the adequate uh, check and balances and audits to demonstrate that this is indeed a feasible alternative to tumor biopsy, uh, with the same aim that uh, ultimately aim that we can actually identify these patients that need an intensive monitoring as well ultimately to triage them into adjuvant clinical trials. For ctDNA, um, we also wanted to see what, what, whether we can detect circulating tumor DNA. Uh, these have been reported previously that they can find circulating tumor DNA in patients with uh, uveal melanoma metastatic and of course the but the what facilitates this in uveal melanoma is the fact that uh, there is a lot of hotspot mutations that we can target. So most uveal melanoma have mutation in GNA, QGNA11, either in Q209L or R183, but also adding to uh, one of the mutations uh, described by uh, Nick Hayward's team, as well as the CCLSTR mutation also recently described. So using that, we basically can cover more than 90% of patients. So we analyze our samples for circulating tumor DNA, and in first, it doesn't correlate with the number of circulating tumor cells, and when we compare to the tumors, it actually doesn't uh, correlate closely to the size of the tumor, either basal, apical, or total volume. Um, one caveat with this data is we do not know what the mutation in the tumor of these patients is, so we actually go blindly with a panel of uh, mute, uh, hotspot mutations, um, and the only in a group of patients we actually know what the mutation of the tumor is. Again, because many of the patients that have a tumor biopsy was not performed. We know that in metastatic uveal melanoma, this, when we use the same panel, we basically take ctDNA in every patient that we have analyzed. Circul uh, metastatic uveal melanoma, pretty much every patient will have circulating tumor DNA. I think it's because of the aggressiveness of the disease and also we know from cutaneous melanoma that liver metastasis produce a lot of circulating tumor DNA. And you can see the comparison between primary cases and metastatic here. If we monitor one uh, utility of circulating tumor DNA in uveal melanoma is for monitoring patients with, uh, uh, with metastatic disease. In our case, it's usually it's not very, um, haven't been very productive in a case because most of the patients don't have any response to treatment, so basically it's just it stays flat or increase over time. And we have the example of this patient that actually uh, have a mixed response to epinevo that was quite interesting because we don't, not many of these cases have a, some sort of response and a long, more or less long-lasting outcomes, although in the last time point the circulating tumor DNA was elevated as well as there was more progressive disease on the PET scan. But our idea is, can we use it to monitor the pre for the presence of metastasis? And doing longitudinal monitoring on patients with primary disease, so we actually enroll the patient with the primary uveal melanoma when it's treated, and then we basically do regular monitoring, and we can find that we start to detect circulating tumor DNA before the scan in the liver was apparent, there was apparent metastasis on the, on the PET scan. Uh, that was then confirmed that there was metastatic disease a few months later. This is another example, sometimes it's a very shallow. This patient actually had large um, uh, circul circulating tumor DNA detected at the time of uh, enucleation. Um, as after enucleation, it, it disappeared, and then it basically develops certain very small concentration of circulating tumor DNA as it goes from ser a serial uh, number of uh, scans. And this is another patient, which you, again we detected before However, I don't have pictures because it's ultrasound based and I actually don't have pictures of that part. 
Uh, but in this, uh, at that time point, there was no detection by ultrasound of liver metastasis, but the circulating tumor DNA was becoming to increase in the blood. So I think it uh, suggests that circulating tumor DNA can be a useful uh, biomarker to monitor patients uh, to complement the scans and can be, do much more regular than, than PET scans or ultrasounds to the liver. So uh, as a conclusion, and, and I think um, what we need to do is basically to do a comprehensive trial, a real rigorous analysis of these two biomarkers with the idea that circulating tumor cells will allow analysis of the cytogenetic of the tumors to define whether the, to, in the cases where a biopsy is not done, to be able to, def, uh, to, to, detect, to determine which patients have high risk of developing metastasis um, and circulating tumor DNA, on the other hand, will be more useful for the identification of patients that have um, occult metastatic disease for the, for an early, for, to implement an early intervention in those cases. With that, I would like to thank my PhD student, Aaron Beasley, which has done a lot of this work, and he's today present here, uh, and uh, Tim Isaacs, an ophthalmologist that basically recruit all these patients within these studies, and Professor uh, Michael Milward, who have been the key oncologist behind this study. And of course, our funders and the patients uh, that volunteer for this study. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. That was a, a very interesting um, talk, and I'm, I'm fascinated by the detection of circulating tumour cells in your primary samples at such a small level, like 1 to 22 cells in, in 8 mils. And looking at the issues that you have with circulating tumour DNA in other solid tumours like, you know, lung and, and colon, and the issue that the cells, that the tumour needs to be shedding at the time of collection in order to detect them, um, I'm just wondering about, you know, you, if your thoughts on the fact that, as happens in the solid tumours, that if you are using this as a, a potential for, um, for metastasis, the incidence, given that you're looking at such small numbers of, of cells in the volume, that you could be thinking, it, you know, you, you could come back with nothing, um, no mutations detected, and yet it could just be that your, your timing of your, of your sample was at a point where the tumour hadn't shed and if you'd sampled two days later or something that you might have seen something given that the, the percentage is so small because obviously with the other solid tumours, your circulating uh, tumour cells are much, much greater than one cell in, in eight mils of blood. Yes, um, yes, um, I, I agree. In fact, we were surprised that we actually detect circulating tumor cells in primary uveal melanoma because the tumor is relatively small compared to when we work with cutaneous melanoma, which we have many years of experience, and we actually don't detect circulating tumor cells in a large number of patients. Um, whether it's because the markers that we use are m much better for capturing uveal melanoma cells is, is might be one explanation. Uh, the variability on the shedding uh, may affect the, the test, and, and I don't foresee that circulating tumor cells, if, if it becomes a test that is available in a clinic, will be, uh, will be positive, will result on identifying circulating tumor cells for every patient. So it is likely that one way that I can see is if you don't want to have the invasive biopsies to do the circulating tumor cells, uh, if you don't find circulating tumor cells, then the patient will require a biopsy. You could do a second sampling. That's another alternative. But, um, but yes, it might be variability on shading. And the numbers are definitely low. I'm, I'm, I'm not in any case. Uh, I, mean, I just want to say that the presence of the cells in that personal blood sample indicates that there is a possibility Yes, so from, from our comparison, and I'm very keen on first looking for the prognostic of all these patients that we, start, we, that we analyze, but second, from our analysis of patients with monosomy 3 and patients without the monosomy 3, what I feel, and, and of course it needs much more data to prove that, is that it's not the shedding what drives the metastasis. The cells, the, the uh, uveal melanoma with lo good prognosis, patients with good prognosis and bad prognosis will produce circulating tumor cells, is actually the capacity to metastasize 
what is driven by this reprogramming. That's what I feel. And, and I actually supported by other studies, previous studies in circulating tumor cells in uveal melanoma, they all have shown that although they find them, and there have been other studies, none of them, the number of circulating tumor cells is not prognostic. It's never been prognostic. It's not the fact that they go in circulation, it's the capacity to metastasize. That's what I feel, and, and perhaps it's it kind of, is it, it, it's mirrored by the data from Bertil uh, that showing that even if you manipulate the tumor, there might be some shedding, but that does not what drive the metastasis. So Ellen, just a quick comment. Uh, I guess specifically with respect to your last slide about the manner in which we might s survey patients after treatment, uh, uh, including liquid biopsy markers as well as imaging, I think we just have to be very careful in, in assuming that PET is the best surveillance imaging modality in these patients. I don't think there's consensus around that. Um, many uveal melanoma patients are in fact relatively negative on PET, and so it might not be such a good um, surveillance test, and that's something we might be able to discuss over the course of today. Okay. I actually wanted to ask you a question, though, um, specifically with, 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 with the CTCs, although it's beautiful data and really nice work, and the genomics are, are obviously very convincing, have you ever been able to propagate those CTs in, uh, CTCs in vitro or in vivo? So is there any evidence that the cells are actually live, viable, clonogenic slash tumorigenic cells? Uh, we, we actually haven't tried to, uh, to, to propagate uveal melanoma. Uh, as you know, we, we've been trying to do that for a while with cutaneous without success. Um, we haven't tried with uveal. Um, um, we should try. <laughs> we haven't got a funding either to, to do that, but it will be interesting uh, to, to, do, to do it considering that we, even in, in metastatic disease, we actually find way more uveal melanoma, uh, circulating tumor cells in uveal melanoma patients than in uh, cutaneous. So that also could be one way to, to, to proliferate it, but not. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Ellen.